This is the Red All Over Way and with me, Josh Averton, and we have Justin Peach from the Second Tier Podcast and other other platforms as well. Um to preview Derby versus Barnsley. Justin, how are you? Yeah, really good. Obviously we're speaking off air, absolutely boiling, and I know it's gonna be a hot one tomorrow for the game as well, which is gonna be gonna be interesting, but I'm I'm in the shade, so I think I'll be alright for the game. That's very, very lucky because from what from Icon at Pride Park, are they away fans in the sun? You're in the corner and you'll get the sun for probably two thirds of the game. So I would uh, I would sun cream up factor 50, absolutely. <laughs> so make sure everyone's got a nice SPF on and, <laughs> and take Justin's advice. So factor 50 just will be a warm one as well. And just say, just going back to the fact po- podcasting in the summer, it's not it's not a nice thing. Yeah, we uh, yeah, we, we, we love podcasting, but we, we do we do give ourselves to our listeners a little bit because, I mean, I'm, I'm not sweating yet, but I imagine in the next 10 minutes I'll start <laughs> dripping. So. Yeah, we are going through it right now. We are going through it. Uh, Justin, just want to explain, like, way from your background as well and uh, what other um, things people might have see, seen you on before, because, no, for me personally, I've seen a lot of your content from the Second Tier podcast. Yeah, obviously, with Bosley being in the championship recently, we would we'd have covered you guys um, extensively. Um, Brian and I uh, have known each other for twenty odd years, and we both started the second tier podcast um, talking about championship football because championship football is amazing. I mean, your season under Valerie and Ishmael was the epitome of why we <laughs> started a podcast on championship football because. It is that air of unpredictability. I know parachute payments does muddy the waters a little bit, but the fact that teams with small budgets and um, don't don't have as much weight as the likes of Fulham's and um, you know just the big clubs, it's it's good to see. And uh, yeah, you, you'd have seen us on there probably praising you guys for most of it, other than last season where it was a bit of a <laughs> car crash season for you guys. But I still tried to find a little bit of a little bit of light in the tunnel, but. Um, yeah, you'd have absolutely seen me on the second tier and um, some Football 365 stuff as well. Uh, and obviously I'm a Derby fan, which um, has has been interesting over the last uh, yeah, two years. Yeah, so obviously we'll get we'll get we'll get right into it. Um Derby, they've seen you've seen some things, especially over last season, because it for me, from like an outside perspective, it was sort of like a coin of two hours, like you've got everything going off off the pitch as well, but it wasn't necessarily, or didn't seem like a bad season. If you take away the twenty-one point deduction, obviously you would have stayed up, and I think comfortably like mid-table-ish as well. Mm. So, what was it like last season in terms of of with just everything? Yeah, it was weird. I think in a way, the off-field stuff made the on-field stuff feel so much better because every goal felt like it was the last goal we were going to see. Like I go back to the Birmingham City game in uh, in January where the Derby fans organised that big march. There's sort of eight or 9,000 supporters in the march. And Bielik scored that equalised, the overhead kick in the 91st or second minute. Fans generally did not know if we were going to have a club or not within the, the, the next few weeks. So that goal going in, it generally was the most sort of awesome feeling of of just euphoria and pride that our clubs, you know, we still got something to fight for. And that was mainly down to the fans. Um, the fans got things going a lot of the time, you know, organising things on social media, getting MPs involved. And I really do think if that wasn't the case, Derby would have gone under because authorities all around, uh, you know, the administrators and obviously the AFL, didn't seem proactive enough to getting things sorted. So in in a weird sense, the off-field stuff made, yeah, as I say, made the on-field stuff feel so much more meaningful and better, And which is why it is probably one of my favourite seasons following Derby. I've been a season ticket holder, holder for 20 years now. I've been a, a 20th season, um, believe it or not, and um, generally have never felt more pride than, than, than last season. Yeah, I think it is a. I think it is a weird one. Obviously, as you say, like you weren't sure if that were going to be like the last of a game or last of a goal, which you've seen. Like, it feels obviously some like because I've never been that predicament per, per, bands. Like that feels something which it would have a lot, a lot more meaning to it, and a lot more um, than than any other game really. Like even mm. if it were like uh, in the playoffs when we got in the playoffs, like it just feel like that would have a a lot more weight to it. Just what was it like then? Because obviously there was, from what I've seen, there are multiple um, sort of buyers coming in and then deals falling through at last minute. What was it like? So obviously you're getting so close to 
like having deals fa- fa- finalized and sort of get getting the club back, but they just always seem to keep f- falling through until like the eleventh hour in a way. Yeah, there was there was three potential takeovers um, spread over about eighteen months, and although they were close, I don't think they were ever that close. You know, just from an outsider's perspective, I think the first one, Sheikh Khalid, who was the uh, cousin of the Man City owner, um, although very distant cousin at that, um, takeover was agreed. Businesses were set up um, to to buy the club, and he never sent. They never sent the the party. Never sent the money across, um, and Derby waited on that for about two or three months, which is probably the reason why. They they scraped relegation by by a point. Um, obviously the the Sheffield Wednesday game, um, just because Derby needed to recruit that January and they were waiting on that deal to be taken over. And for some reason, they waited for the money for six or seven weeks. And then there was the Eric Alonso takeover in April um, that that same season, which is weird because someone like Eric Alonso again, Sheffield Wednesday fans will know him well. Should be nowhere near football, um, and it was absolutely hilarious how it how it transpired um, to the point where he was appearing on Talk Sport saying, "Oh, you know, we, we'll get to European football." And as soon as potential owners start saying stuff like that, real red flags start to start to you know chime. Um, and in the end, he that why well, to say it fell through. I think the club just gave up on him because you know, when you get to a point when you're posting random videos of houses on TikTok claiming they're your own. Um, which is a completely true story. I don't know how how aware fans of out, outside of Derby are aware of that. Um, it is it is a bonkers story, and there's a lot of articles on it. Um, and then there's the Chris Kirchner uh, deal as well, which again is laughable. The fact that he's been kicked out of his own company because he's been gallivanting a lifestyle he could not afford. Um, I don't know how he got so far in the process with 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 buying Derby because. Again, another person who didn't send the money across when it mattered clearly didn't have it. And as I say, he's been he's been removed from his own company. So that, that goes to show. And there's there's been other bids that have come in. Um, but again, the administrators that's a whole other story about how not to um not to handle the club in administration, I think, would be the uh, wisest way to say it. Yeah, it's definitely something which like I feel so much shit for all Derby fans, given what you've sort of been through, as you say, like there were um, the three people coming in that you have thought might be, but as you say, like there's a lot of a lot of red flags, it seems like a lot of like flaunting as well in terms of the owners trying to make it look mm-hmm. like they've got more than what the, the, than what it seems as well. So moving forward now into obviously you have now been taken over and it's and it's um, it seems like it's the beginning of a new era for Derby um, underneath new ownership. What's that transition kind of been like? Does it feel like fans have got have got the club back in a way. Yes, in a, in, a, in a very blunt and simple answer, yes. Mainly because it's a fan who's taken over. David Klaus, he sat, he had a season ticket in the North Stand. He went to every home and away game. Um, and now the North Stand is just a family stand. It's the quiet stand. Um, you know, he's not sitting in the, um, you know, he's not sitting in a box or any snazzy seats in Pride Park. I don't think there are any, but... Um, the North Stand is is the definition of a family stand. It's a quiet place where, you know, you take your family. Um, <laughs> cheaper tickets as well. Um, and yeah, he's come in and he's taken over. And yeah, it does feel like we've got the club back. It, you know, the communication has been just a revelation. Just fresh communication from a club is absolutely fantastic. I know you guys went through something similar, mm-hmm. obviously, with the one of the stands closing last season. And just having clear, transparent communication from your from your club is so so important. It goes such a long way to keeping fans on board. Because as soon as fans start to turn, things can get toxic very very quickly. Um, and and that's been that's been the key difference. And he's back, Liam Rossini, who's still the interim manager, um, but he has backed Liam Rossini by bringing in players as well. And as I say, it does it does feel like a new era, um, and we've needed it because the Mel Morris chapter has been. Absolutely horrendous from the moment he took over to the moment he sold the club. It's been it's been an uncomfortable roller coaster. It's um it's well it's great to see obviously that fans um feel like they've got that connection back and I think that's very important that uh, the new owner sort of has that connection as well to Dar because it, I think that goes a long a long way as well in sort of it being sort of one of your own um, instead of it just being some sort of no faced um businessman from overseas exactly. that's come in. So I think that's I think like you said it is well on its way to be coming back and especially the clear lines communication as well. That's so important because 
I think when clubs are too slow to inform fans or try to try to take to take the times to obviously make the best to try and spin things and make things sound a little bit mm. different, it it just leaves a bit a bit of a sour taste as well. And see through it. They see through yeah, it, don't they? Exactly. Exactly. It's it's very easy to see through. Uh, you touched on a point there that Liam Rossini, interim manager. Um, were you shocked to see Way Rooney depart sort of over the mm. uh, over the off season? Um, I was shocked at the timing, uh, mainly because the takeover was done was going to be done the sort of a couple of days after he he'd resigned. Um, so conversations probably take took place, um, but I wasn't shocked to see him leave, mainly because he was quite close. He was tied quite close to the takeover of Chris Kirchner. Um, again, just a little bit of background. Um, Rooney's agent was going to be on the board. Rooney had put his weight behind the Chris Kirchner bid and obviously that fell through. Chris Kirchner turned out to be a, another charlatan who should be nowhere near football. So I think his position in some way was was untenable. Now his statement, he said he wants to spend more time with his family. Three or four weeks later, he's a manager of DC United. Can't get further away from his family. <laughs> um, so uh, I was surprised at the timing mainly, but not surprised that he left. And I think again, the, 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 the club needed a completely new start. Um, and I think him leaving... Albeit he he led the club, um, you know, with pride. He put pride back into into the football club, which was his his main aim, and he did that. Um, but I think Liam Rossini coming over, you know, fair to say he's the brain. He was the brains behind Wayne Rooney. Um, Rossini coming in, I think, is a really shrewd move. Do you think that uh, Derby will stick with Rossini? So obviously, he's coming, um, and like you say, he's in that interim role. And Rick Blackpool that were um, after him as well at some point, and he's turned him down to stay at Derby. So, do you think that it will probably end up with a full time job? Fingers crossed. I think this interim aspect is just a case of just phasing it through because obviously, Rooney leaving a few days before pre season starts, the club was, you know, amidst the takeover and then having to recruit a squad. Um, you just want a safe pair of hands and Rossini at that point was a safe pair of hands. I was surprised that Rossini wasn't offered the full-time job when Philip Cocker left a couple of seasons ago. Um, I'd have probably gone with Liam Rossini because he's more qualified and he is a very, very good coach um, and he's shown that over the last 18 months to two years um, and, and I would like to see him get the full-time job. Obviously, results dependent. The style of play has been actually really good to see it's been quite similar to last season or be a bit more fluid mm-hmm. um and we're creating quite a few more chances um but yeah and no, i think it would be a mistake to see rusinia leave and again obviously if he loses 10 games on the bounce then you know i'm a, f- I'm a fickle <laughs> football fan get him gone but at the moment <laughs> oh, yeah i'm in love with him <laughs> yeah he seems like i think it does make sense in terms of like that continuity and as you say like he is a very highly touted sort of coach and uh from, from what i've read um, previously that it was the sort of brains behind Rooney and very mm. seems like a very hands-on number two instead of just sort of so, someone there to massage his ego. He seemed like he was quite heavily involved in that in that side. You spoke there about recruitment and I'll be honest, I am very jealous of Derby's recruitment so far this season. Albeit, it's it, from my perspective, it seems like you're looking for a pretty immediate return to championship and right and rightly so, really. Um and there's one player in particular that I'm extremely jealous of. Um, I've been seeing him up, up close for two seasons and know, know what he's capable of, of uh, Connor Hurrian. Um, what have what were Derby fans' sort of thoughts and feelings when you had players like Hurrian coming through the door, David McGoldrick, Thomas Barkus, and you've got some, for, for me, you've got a lot of championship quality players in there. Yeah, three years ago, that team wins the league in the championship. Um, true, maybe less so true. now. Maybe less so now, given their age and sketchy injury records. But we'll we'll look past that for yeah, all intents and purposes. I, I was I was I was really pleased with the with, with how the transfers came about because um, from what I heard, they weren't just you know phone call to their agent get him in. Rusinia was chasing Hurahan all summer. Um, apparently, they they. We're in uh, on holiday at the same location, and Rusini was hassling Hurahan uh, and trying to get him um, to, to to buy into the project. And I think that's what it is. He's managed to sold sell a project um, to these players because they're all big names. You know, you mentioned McGoldrick and, and Connor Hurahan, and there's James Chester as well. James Collins, James Collins. Um, I'm not surprised to see him leave Cardiff, but I'm surprised that he's not at another Championship club. Um, because okay, he might not be the most clinical of forwards, but he will get you ten goals in the championship quite easily. 
Um, so for us to get him on a free transfer, I think is probably one of the purchases. I say purchase one of the one of the transfers of the summer, especially in League One level. Um, but it's been very much a case of recruit a solid spine and then prop up the squad with, with youngsters. Nathaniel Mendes Langer is another one. He's, he's he's been a really superb addition to the team, and um, I think he'll get bags of assists. So. Yeah, I think it's a case of Rossini has worked incredibly hard because Derby don't have a recruitment department at the moment. Um, oh, there's really? no, yeah, they were one of the ones, they were the one of the sacrifices in the administration. So there's, there's barely a recruitment department. Um, so it's all been Rossini and, and and some of the coaching staff getting on the phone and um, trying to convince these players that Derby's the right place for them. That's well, that's testament to Rossini to be honest as himself because it's not necessarily a part of the, it's not a part of the job that you'd sort of assigned to a, a coach mm-hmm. or a manager you have to go and do you have to go out and do that and a testament to the man really to for putting sort of the, his passion like behind the project as you said uh, for Derby uh, one thing I've got to like, obviously um, I'd consider Barnsley Derby Pete, Peterborough like all the sides which have come down sort of come you'd assume that we'd be competing for similar players I was wondering if you got any insight on how um, like the way structure is at Derby because obviously as soon as you went and signed all these championship quality players. I, I I just saw, especially from a band's perspective, we were like, why are we not in for these players? Like if we can compete with them, because I know that everything has, is, um, is it like an agreed way structure with the FL and it has to get signed off by the FL before you can even sign the players? Pretty much. Yeah. And I think the wage cap on salaries is 8,000 a week. So that is still quite a lot for a league one club. Um, but given Derby's, um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to think. Not, 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 not stature, but ability to fill the ground is going to drain out a lot of income. Sponsors will still be quite favourable to Derby. Um, the only drop in income is 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 TV revenue from dropping from mm-hmm. the Championship to League One. That pretty much halves. Um, so Derby still a bit like Sunderland still have the capacity to offer these wages, whereas I imagine a Peterborough wouldn't want to offer eight thousand pounds a week to a Conor Hurahan who is thirty one years old. Um. And and again, that's the reality of Derby's situation. They can't go out and convince players in their prime that the club might be for them. They have to go out and get these players who have had injuries in the past, are past their prime, or coming to the end of their prime. And uh, you know that's the that's the whole, I guess, the whole tra- stra- strategy of putting together a squad this summer. Yeah, it seems it seems sensible in a way to bring in these more experienced heads because you just feel like they might gel together quicker a, little, a more, more than if you did bring in like a bunch of youngsters. But obviously, mm-hmm. bringing in these older heads, like there's no there's not necessarily much resale value within that. But I think for me, it's sort of sensible in terms of looking for an immediate return to the championship or at least building that spine because everyone's only 30, 31, so you could probably get another two decent mm. seasons out for, from him and it's Thomas Barker who's only 28 as well yeah if I'm yeah, right yeah. so there's, there's a couple of players in there that still there's there, there's a few years of legs in them before anything else so I, I do think that I'm just jealous to be honest <laughs> I'm just I'm just jealous of players which you've brought in um so looking forward to tomorrow um what how do you feel about coming up against Barnes in a way? Because obviously, I think it is two clubs going through a transition period, and I know our boards come out and again something which I would have personally done said we need to bridge seven or eight million pound um, in in player sales for as you mentioned the drop in TV rights and t- TV revenue. Um, what are your thoughts about coming up against a transitional Barnes aside? Yeah, it's, it's 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 a weird one because I look at Michael Duff and I I rate him very highly as a coach. Um, I think he's, again, a bit like Nathan Jones and Luton. He's worked with a club with one of the smallest budgets or the smallest budget in its league and over overachieved. And that is the um, that is the definition of a very talented coach. So to go out and get him, um, I think, is, is brilliant. I think my disappointment with Barnsley is they haven't looked like they've tried to replace the players that have gone. You know, you've you've lost a lot of goals and leadership through Corley Woodrow mm-hmm. and there's Carlton Morris as well. Um, but there are still there is still a semblance of a, a decent championship team there, albeit with with needing additions. So depending on how Michael Duff can transition the team, because he's probably a bit more Ishmael than he is any other um uh sort of manager of style of place. He's a little bit more direct, or well, that's what I know from his Cheltenham days anyway. Um and I think that will that makes me a little bit nervous for tomorrow, just because Derby and their ability to compete physically 
at this level is the one thing that worries me. Um, going back to the Mansfield game in midweek, they're a team that got in your face, got very physical and direct in sort of the first 20 minutes of the second half, and they could have been a 3-1 up. Um, so if, if you know if Michael Duff can sort of replicate that, not necessarily the intensity, especially in the heat, um, then the game will probably favour Barnsley. But if 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 Derby can can gather some semblance of control and retain the ball and, and make make um, make the players run about a bit and tie them out, um, the game might might um, jump into their favour. So yeah, it, really, it just depends um, how the teams um, sort of feel the way into into the game. Because again, I know it's a bit of a cop out, but the heat's going to play a big difference into how intense the game's going to be. Um, just because again. You're not going to be able to 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 keep up for 90 minutes a high pressing game. Yeah, definitely. I think I think it will be a massive factor because you it's something that players aren't really conditioned for. Because football is more or less like a it's like a wintry spring awesome sport. Exactly. There's, not, there's not there's not many games in this kind of heat, so it is it will definitely play a factor. So so far this season, who has been the standout players for Derby? Nathaniel Mendes Lang. Um, straight off the bat with him, he's. I di- he's a direct winger. I'm surprised Sheffield Wednesday didn't want to keep hold of him. I know they don't play a system that might suit him, but as I say, he's a direct winger. He wants to get to the byline. He wants to pull across in. I've not seen, for all the millions Derby have spent under Mel Morris, I've not seen a player like him since, I don't know, probably going back to Gary Teal in you know, 2007. Um, he's, he's he's so uh, such an old school sort of winger, where, as I say, he just wants to get to the byline and put balls in the box. When you got someone like James Collins, in the six-yard box, in the 18-yard box, he's going to get chances. And you've got Tom Barkhausen as well, who can sniff chances out for fun. So Nathaniel mendez Lang is really impressed. Um, another one I think will hopefully start tomorrow is Lewis Sibley. Obviously, played a lot of games in the Championship. Last two seasons have been a bit underwhelming, but he looks to have found a little bit of a spark. Um, and he's made an impact in the two games he's come off the bench so far and played very well in midweek against Mansfield. And he's got the ability to turn the game on its head, especially if it's a tight game, which I think it will be. I think it will be tomorrow. I think he's got that that ability to score a goal from 20, 30 yards or make that killer pass. Yeah, there's one it's one bad thing we're doing these um away end videos is that as soon as team as soon as people start saying the positives of their team, like that's exactly a negative of ours. <laughs> like there's we've had issues, not necessarily this this season, but especially last season. Um, down the channel, so someone like Nathaniel Mendes Lang would have been a nightmare for us last season. Whereas I think Michael Duff's made us a lot, uh, a lot more solid this season. I think mm. if we're going to win games, we're going to win a lot of games one nil, and it's going to not just be the most entertaining game, but it's, I think we're just going to be a case of grind out results. So I think it's going to be an interesting one tomorrow because for me, Derby is such a an unknown entity because of the amount of transition players yeah. which have come in. Like it's difficult to try and place where you'll be this season because I know when we did as uh, pre-season predictions I, I could have put Derby either last or first and I've, I've really weren't sure which one to go with end up going because as soon as you sign Connor I was like that's it top six minimum. <laughs> you'll be fine there um, Justin I'm going to push you for a score prediction how do you feel what, what do you think tomorrow's score will be I think it'll be quite an open game tomorrow. I, I know I said it might be tight, but I, I do fancy some goals tomorrow, mainly because Derby don't like the direct approach, but they've got the ability to attack teams with the players that they've got. So I, I do think it'll be a, a, an end-to-end game at times, a bit chaotic. That's League One football mm. um, in a nutshell, which is a nice thing to see, actually. Um, so I'm going with a 2-2. I'm going to be I'm going to sit on the fence a bit. I think a 2-2 will be a, a okay. decent result against uh, against you guys tomorrow. I'd I'd like to see a two-two, but my only thing is I just don't see us scoring two goals in one <laughs> game. Goals is definitely something that we're we're struggling to come by at the minute. So it's it's gonna be a tough one. I think in our preview show I went from two two nil to Derby. Mm. So I've got more I, I've got more faith in Derby than I think you have, or either that or you just you just don't see our striker woes at the minute because it's just that conversion for us. We can get into a decent position, but then it's just. We're relying on, I think, Jack Aitchison, who came from Forest Green last season. Mm. He spent a year out on loan there. And James Nor- Norwood, who is just still getting something up to speed and with this style of play as well. So it's good to see that other people have got confidence in his scoring <laughs> rather than just me. Uh, Justin, again, just want to give a quick shout out to the other podcasts and things which you do. 
Yep, uh, it's at Second Tier Pod. Obviously, if you guys want to still catch up with the championship, we're, we're still there. There's still mentions of Barnsley because of that season. Um, <laughs> so yeah, definitely, definitely not going quiet. But yeah, it's at, at Second Tier Pod. I'm, I'm sure everyone will be well aware by now. Yeah, definitely. I know it keeps me up to date because I found out that DK has picked up his third injury since he's been at West mm-hmm. Brom. Yeah, which yep. I, which I found astounding because he just seemed like he was so robust when he played for us and. We got like a full half a season from him, and he's only is it only three appearances missed for West Brom since January? Yeah, what's nine million pounds? Yeah, three appearances might miss the World Cup for the US as well. Yeah, it's not been not been a good start to his yeah. life at the Midlands. <laughs> it seems it seems very strange because he's just built so robust as well that you'd think injuries wouldn't be no issue for him. But but there it is. That's for football. Maybe Steve Bruce just has got just doesn't know how to keep him fit. This could be yeah, an like, issue yeah. for him. So it's a, a curious case of uh, yeah, championship football, and I imagine that will be a, a similar curse with um, other other big big money signings. Always is the case. Yeah, that's true. As always, Reds, make sure to like and subscribe, and get your score predictions in the comments below as well. Because this one will be counting towards the fifteen game um, prize draw. So make sure you get comments in in below. Andy will come and find all your score predictions, and make sure they're logged as well. And let's see what happens on Saturday. Could it be a two-two draw, like Justin says, or will people be as pessimistic as me for a two for, for a two-nil loss? It's only one way to find out, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs>